So let's start. Uh, who in this room has ever heard of an aqua hire? Okay, so about half. And who in this room has ever participated in an aqua hire on either the buying side or the target side? All right, so hopefully we'll have a lot of ground to cover today. So today I'm going to be talking about this buzzword, the aqua hire, and I'm going to be drawing on my research, which is with Kyle Mayer, also at the University of Southern California, as well as some of the research of our colleagues in the field. So first I'm going to define what exactly the aqua hire phenomenon is. I'm going to try to explain to you where it comes from and what the mechanism and the drivers are. And then I'm going to talk about the conditions under which firms strategically select aqua hiring instead of the other human resource relationships that are available to them. Finally, I'm going to talk about some controversies with the aqua hire because I think anybody who reads the news with aqua hiring today sees a lot of headlines that say things like the death of the aqua hire, aqua hires suck, things along that line. But I actually think they could be very useful. All right, so the obvious question, what on earth is the aqua hire? So the short version we have here says that the aqua hire describes the process of using acquisition as a mechanism to hire a team of employees from a company with no other assets of significant interest to the acquirer. So let's break that down. All right, so here we have M&A, which is being used in kind of an unusual fashion as a hiring mechanism. It's being used to actually bring on a team of people rather than the typical focus, which is on bringing on products and technology. Then we can see that an M&A is classified as an aqua hire when it's obvious that the acquiring firm really doesn't care about the product or the patents. In fact, we usually see that they are shuttered after the acquisition. So that would tend to go against most of the dominant literature, which we'll get to in a second. All right, so how do we know that an aqua hire is actually happening? So according to research from places like CB Insights and also from some of my colleagues, Chatterjee and Patro, we can see that we're typically looking at early stage startups. This can happen as early as six months after the project is founded um, and between a couple years old. We won't usually see it after that because startups that are more late stage and they're moving to later funding rounds are really less open to being acquired in this way. And their products have moved forward and they have a customer base. And we know that in Silicon Valley, a lot of people are serial entrepreneurs and they don't want to anger that base such that they can't get out there again and do another project. Now typically we'll see that these are small startups. They often have six or less employees, which is kind of typical of startups anyway. And we see that in the aqua hire, a third of the team will be founders, who usually have some kind of engineering background if they're not MBAs, and then the other two thirds are engineers. Often they'll be doing other functions like biz dev. We don't really see a lot of other support staff in there. And then, as I said before, we see that the product in an aqua hire is not capitalized. So I think it's pretty amazing that in an aqua hire, 92% of the products are actually sunset after they come on to the acquiring firm. So a great example of this is a few years ago, there was an MP3 firm called Amy Street. They invented a way to have MP3 prices fluctuate up or down depending on popularity. It was a model that had never been seen before in the MP3 market. When they were aqua hired by Amazon, people were thinking, well, this is really interesting. It's patent pending. We're probably going to see this incorporated into Amazon's MP3 store. But within a month, they shut down the entire website and they were pivoted over to work on another product that Amazon had called Songza which really had actually nothing to do with the kind of algorithm they were working on at Amy Street. At that point, it became really obvious that what they were looking for was people that could think out of the box. And what way they think out of the box wasn't as important, but just the fact that they could think out of the box. Now, in a few cases, we do see a partial integration of that technology into the acquirer portfolio, but I really think that's more um, due to chance than anything else. It's certainly not the driver. Okay, so in M&A, what do firms typically consider? The conventional wisdom in all of the management and economics literature says that a firm is going to buy a startup because it has technological assets and other assets that are in conjunction with those tech assets. So they're gonna want 
the services that are connected to the product. They're going to want to capture that customer base. Maybe they even want the supply chain relationships. A lot of reasons, but basically in this model, the human capital that comes along is just a bonus. It could be those original engineers, or you could hire new engineers, and it would be fine. Sort of swap in, swap out. Now in the AquaHire, we're looking at a completely converse situation where we're saying, no, firms are actually buying the startup for their human capital, and it's the tech asset that doesn't really matter because all it was in the first place was an economic signaling device. So what we see here is that the quality of the technology is being used only as a proxy for the quality of the underlying human capital. So if we see that within six months they have kind of a demo and it doesn't work that great, but we can see that it has great potential and that's enough to know that these people are really smart, then that's enough for them to move forward with the M&A. This is basically because here we could say that M&A isn't really driven by what we call a search for solutions. It's driven by what we call the search for problem solving. Now, in Silicon Valley, we know that M&A is really, really common, and a lot of it focuses on startups, right? Over to the left, you can see these figures for the US at large, so thousands and thousands of deals per year, and Silicon Valley is one of the most active markets. 88% of these exits are actually pretty small at 100 million or less, and so that means that most of them are in startup land. But the question here is how does the aqua hire actually fit into that? Is it something really significant and growing, or is it just kind of a small anecdotal thing that a few strange firms like Google and Facebook like to do? So let's consider why aqua hire has emerged at this time. It's not actually new. In the 1990s, Cisco liked to do this thing that they called spin out, spin in. So they would send off their people, tell them to start new companies, let them grow a little bit, see how they did, and then they would acquire them right back in order to get the new product teams. But then we have this big lag, right? Like between the 1990s when Cisco is generating some buzz about that, and 2005, when the first new mention comes in, is a lot of time. So at that point, we see that this one tech blogger, Rex Hammock, has noticed that Google has acquired this teeny tiny company called Dodgeball. It's basically two guys and a little product that they've launched like less than a year before. And he says, I am going to call this the ACK hire, because what I think I just saw is a hire with a giant signing bonus. After that, we see a period where a few other tech blogs start buzzing about it, and there's a lot of ack hiring going on underneath the surface at Facebook and Google, but still nobody is talking about it. I think in part because at that point, nobody could decide how this would be spelled. So we would see that Rex Hammett called it the ack hire. Other people were calling it the ack hire. It was very hard to Google something and to understand a trend that everyone was spelling in seven different ways. In 2010, the New York Times linguist Ben Zimmer decides he's going to analyze the word. He's not really sure how to spell it either. So finally, we get to 2011, where the New York Times decides that they're going to take a stand on what this thing is called. And when they feature AquaHire on the front page of the New York Times, we can finally start to understand the phenomenon because we're all talking about it in the same way. But going back to Cisco, what is really, really new about this new resurgence of aqua hires, regardless of how we spell it, is that it's become not just this sort of fun thing that someone does as an experiment with HR, but a really integral part of the whole HR strategy. This is something where firms are going in order to survive in Silicon Valley. We have to participate in aqua hires. We have to be able to get people this way because they fulfill an essential function and a capability that we don't think that we are going to be able to get elsewhere. So that's something I'm going to go into more in a bit. So in the first few years, we really only see six firms that are appearing in the news for aqua hires. That's Facebook, Google, Twitter, Zynga, LinkedIn, and Yahoo. So it really looks like something that just a small consortium of companies has decided would maybe be better than just poaching from each other. 
right? So we don't know, is this really an HR strategy or is this just a small fight that some Silicon Valley firms are having? But now we can see that in the news, people are starting to talk about this as a wider trend. We see that now companies that we don't think of as traditionally Silicon Valley are picking it up. When I think Silicon Valley, Accenture is not the first company that I think of, and neither is Palantir. These are more part of the defense industrial complex. So we can see that it's broader than Silicon Valley high tech. It's about frontier technology in general. So let's take a quick snapshot of Facebook, just so we can understand what this looks like for one of the main firms that's doing it. So from 2007 to 2014, we see that Facebook had 49 acquisitions that could be classified as acquihires. That's a lot. And we also see that there seems to be no particularly particular strategy as to which verticals they're targeting, right? We see that they're picking up some game companies, some people that are in mobile startups, some design guys, some people who do advertising. It's just here, it's there. People are trying to guess what direction Facebook is going in from who they're aqua hiring, and they can't. And the reason for that is that it's not about the verticals. It's about these other commonalities that we can't see on the outside. Their capability to do high level analytical thinking, the kind of education that they have. You can kind of see on the bottom a little bit, it's probably blurry, that there are all these mug shots of the guys that they've aqua hired. And to me, they basically look like the same guy over and over. He's in his mid 20s. He probably went to an Ivy League computer science program. He's very well educated. He's awesome at coding. And maybe he has an idea, but really you're measuring the strength of his skill set. This is why at that time, Facebook became famous for saying that they were happy to pay a million dollars per engineer if necessary. And really, they did. In that reported sale range, you can see that there were several acquisitions they had that were 2.5 to 15 million. So that's a lot more than a million dollars per engineer when the company has like three or four people in it. And then we have a few that are 16 million to even one billion dollars with Instagram. So not every company is doing what Facebook did. And these days, it's definitely not a million dollars per engineer. But Facebook was trying to send a message that the value here was really in the kinds of people that they are getting. We have this quote where Mark Zuckerberg says, Facebook has not once bought a company for the company itself. We buy companies to get excellent people. Now, that's not necessarily true in every case. We know there are some acquisitions that were about the tech, but he's trying to send a message to the rest of Silicon Valley in that he's saying, I can solve more complex problems than you because I have better people than you, and thus I can stay ahead of the game. So what exactly is the reason why Mark Zuckerberg and everybody else thinks that they need to be solving really complex problems all the time? So in a nutshell, Silicon Valley, enormous pressure cooker, right? We have, over the last couple decades, a lot of different external factors that are happening all at once. And that means that people constantly need to be reaching breakthroughs, not just incremental innovation, but actually breakthrough innovation on a regular basis. The product cycles are about 18 to 24 months. That's really a breakneck pace. And we're also seeing a lot of convergence across different technologies. So you guys know that your phone is basically now also your TV screen for a lot of people. That's an example of convergence. We know that digital technology means that telecom and media are now basically the same industry. And today, we're seeing that the growth of artificial intelligence and robotics is going to create convergence across every market that makes use of hardware and software. And so what this is going to mean is that those trends that we already see in play, where we need to have swift and regular breakthroughs, mean that that's going to be even more the case, because there's going to be room for even less players at the top of that market. Now, the way that people get ahead in a pressure cooker like this is that they have individuals that are capable of what's called essential complexity. Now, there's a famous computer scientist named Fred Brooks. And he coined the term, so I'm not going to take credit for essential complexity versus accidental complexity. But what he was trying to say is that there is a big difference 
between somebody that can fix something that's just, you know, inherently inefficient. So here I have the example of this Rube Goldberg machine, right? This guy, he wants to change the channel on his television system. So he has created his own system to do that. It probably works, as a lot of Rube Goldberg machines do, but it is full of accidental complexity. And an engineer that's good at dealing with that would just come in there and go, OK, I think I can take out five to seven of these steps. Now, the engineer that's capable of essential complexity, the one who comes up with the infrared technology to use the TV remote, is a completely different type of engineer than the first guy. He's able to think at an abstract level. He's able to go, not what is this situation and how do I streamline it, but how do I think completely out of the box with what we have now? And that's why the infrared remote here is such a quantum leap. And what's really amazing is that we need to see at places like Google and Facebook that kind of quantum leap happening literally every few months. That's one of the big drivers for constantly looking outside the firm at startups for the people that can come up with an infrared remote on a regular basis. So this leads us to what I call the engineer talent war. It goes on all the time, even outside of Aqua Hire land, and it's pretty crazy. We can see that constantly the firms are poaching from each other. So this is from 2010, where it says that 12% of Facebook employees are former Google employees. I think that's even more true now. And another thing that we find is that a lot of Pinterest employees are former Facebook employees. There seems to be a certain circle that people like to follow that you can trace in the valley. You can see that the engineers' average salaries, and these are for engineers that are coming straight out of college with no previous experience, are very, very high compared to their peers. And we can see that the office amenities that they're being offered are honestly kind of mind-blowing. They're being given amazing chef-catered food, um, access to offices with views, chance to play at work, video game systems. I think that we see a lot of companies getting more and more creative about what they're going to do to get young people straight out of school out of the best programs. But that still doesn't tell us why the specific focus on aqua hiring instead of just pursuing these kinds of recruiting strategies. So really what it is is that we have a puzzle around M&A. When a firm decides how it is going to bring a human resource into the firm, it has to think about two choices. The first choice is are we going to try to access the human resources internally or are we going to try to get them externally? So internally would be what we think of as traditional hiring, right? Bringing people in through traditional hiring or acquisition. And externally is the situation where you have contractors, joint ventures. Now we know that that is not typically going to work in this situation, right? Because when it comes to innovation becoming such a core part of market competition, you're not really going to want to risk having an external contractor. So we know also that with the economics and management literature, it tells us that when we have core competencies and we farm them out, we increase what's called exchange hazards. This means that we increase the chance that our intellectual property goes floating out the door, and we also increase the chance that we're going to be innovating with people that might not be there tomorrow. So that means that actually our primary puzzle is just between those last two options. Why is it that a firm can't just focus on those recruiting strategies and directly hire all the people that it needs? Why can't they just get some really bright kids out of Stanford and have them do essential complexity? So here is our argument in a nutshell. The reason that a firm is going to acquire instead of traditionally hire is that it will have met all of these preconditions. The first one we just talked about where a firm is going to be engaged in complex problem solving all the time on a regular basis. The second one is that in order to do this, a firm will find that it needs someone who is called a star problem solver. And that person is typically going to have some experience. And as their experience has grown, 
they're going to have become embedded in an existing team. This is going to become pretty salient in a moment. Now the last prerequisite is that now that we know that we have a team we're going after, it will also be important that that team is pretty small. If we're trying to bring on a team of 50 people, trying to do it through acquisition is probably going to be more expensive than most firms even want to think about. Okay, so what is this question then of this star performer, this person who apparently can't be an undergrad straight out of Stanford and can't just be paid $110,000? A star performer in the literature is somebody who stands out as a person who is not just more productive than all of their peers, they are a hundred times more productive. This is the person that Mark, Zim sorry, that Mark Zuckerberg is trying to identify. They are also a person who is more likely to come up with breakthrough innovations instead of incremental innovations. Because of this, they are a person who's going to be very, very visible in the labor market that they are in. So for instance, if I am a star performer at a hospital, I'm going to be the person that's in the news because I just did the brain surgery on the conjoined twins. And everybody is going to know who I am and they're going to want to come poach me. Or if I am, in our other example here, the star analyst, I'm going to be the person that gets the forecast right so often that they start writing articles about me. So that means that when you're thinking about the star performer, you also have to think about the fact that everybody else on the market is trying to obtain them as well and that their performance is very, very visible. However, here's the catch. A star performer who's a star performer at their old institution isn't necessarily going to be a star performer at your institution. Now this seems kind of obvious, but in most of the reports over the last 10 years that come out in the news or in you know, Harvard Business Review or other magazines, the dominant wisdom has been that if you manage to snatch somebody out of a firm, their best trial lawyer or their best surgeon, that now your firm's stock is going to go up because you have a huge win, right? People don't typically consider that the asset might not be as portable as they hoped. But when we look at the actual research, we can see from this study here on surgeons and this was done over several years with hundreds and hundreds of surgeons, that when they moved out of their own hospital to another hospital and they did the exact same surgeries that they're doing at their own hospital every day, they never thought that there was a decline in their performance, but there was. There was a significant uptick in patient deaths when they were looking at triple bypasses on these surgeries. And the surgeons had no idea because to them it felt the same. But the fact is, when they went over to this other hospital, they'd have a different nurse team, a different anesthesiologist, and this was making a real difference to them without them even knowing it. Similarly, we have this research on star analysts. This is the product of six or seven different studies that Boris Groisberg at Harvard has been doing with his colleagues over the last 10 years, at least. It's a lot. They have studied absolutely every aspect of the star performer. And what they have found is the same. That in every instance, when an analyst moves from their old firm to a new firm and they don't have their previous team, their performance declines. If the quality of their colleagues at the new team isn't as high as at the old team, um, because they might have gone to a firm that's smaller where they can be a big fish, then their performance will decline even more. Now in the converse situation where we measure that their team has come over with them and that we know that their team was also high performance, we see almost no decline at all. So what does that tell us? Even if this star performer had fairly, you know, average but high performing people around them who in themselves didn't seem special, they're part of a system that breaks if you try to pull the person out. And so the takeaway from that for aqua hires is that teams are really, really key to star performance and they can't actually be separated from the value of that. So an aqua hire strategy is inherently a team capture strategy. So here, an alternate example then. 
What about lift outs? So anybody who's uh, familiar with the law might know that law firms do not typically do aqua hires, but they do what's called lift outs all the time. This is a situation where one firm goes to another firm and arranges to poach an entire team of people at the same time, right? So that would seem to be pretty clever. Okay, so we didn't have to do the M&A. We were able to get the whole team anyway, and it wasn't as expensive as it would be if we tried to buy the whole firm. Now, lift outs are pretty common with lawyers, doctors, even entire academic labs. I don't know if any of you noticed in the news recently that Uber lifted 50 roboticists from Carnegie Mellon University. That was actually more than half of their major robotics labs. So this fall, they're going to be reeling from that a little bit. But that means that Uber literally came in and instead of acquiring the labs or the startups that spun off from the labs, they just made arrangements with all of these people to leave and come on board to Uber at the same time. So the pros here are pretty obvious. We can see that it's cheaper than M&A. It's going to be a lot faster. It can work for large groups. So why on earth then would we ever acquire, right? Well, the truth is that it tends to create a really negative psychological setting for the ensuing employment relationship between the people who are poached and the people that are stakeholders of the people that are poached and the firm that they're coming on board to. So a startup will often have outside stakeholders who include advisors, investors, people who are really vested in that startup's future performance. They are obviously not going to be very thrilled if an outsider just comes in and poaches them. It also means that because you've come on board in a situation where a firm tells you that they're okay with poaching you out of your firm, you're not going to feel very bad if this happens again and another firm comes to you and says, hey, I can even double your salary from what it was before. Now we know that because star performers are very visible in their markets, that this is actually a pretty likely thing to have happen. So this is why one of the big strengths of ACO hiring is that using M&A in this way might allow us to set a more positive employee relationship with the acquired firm. In my research with my colleague Kyle Mayer, we talk about some of the factors that might come into play. The way that the aqua hire structure might improve autonomy for individuals that come on board that way. It creates a lot more trust because often there will be a kind of coaching relationship between the company that's watching the startup to see how it does. And that'll come on, sorry, that'll happen for a couple months before the startup makes a decision to come on board. And we also see that there is a commitment to each other in a much more positive manner. And then there is also that positive status and prestige. When you're acquired, you're going to get this nice news article that says that your firm was purchased for a nice sum of money, and it's going to make you feel pretty good and also much more embarrassed if you were to suddenly leave the firm for a better offer since you've just gotten all of this positive press. The other thing is that the aqua hire structure financially is also one that allows you to keep up a good relationship with your stakeholders. So up in the screen, I hope it's not too blurry, is it kind of visible? You guys can see what the deal structure of an aqua hire looks like. So we have two separate pools of consideration here. First we have the deal consideration and this is the actual cash that's going to be used to acquire the startup. This is actually not the big lump sum. It's just enough money to make sure that the investors can kind of write this off. It's not going to be a loss or a big win. It's just going to be enough so that they're not too angry. And it's some money that can also go to employee shareholders, including people that are not necessarily going to go to the acquiring company. Now the other portion, the compensation pool, that is what's reported in the news. That is actually tied mainly to equity in the acquiring company. So when Google says that it made a very big aqua hire and it was worth $50 million, a lot of that, maybe $40 million, might be shares of Google that are gifted to the people that are coming on board, not actual cash. And so this means that they have to wait typically three to four years for that to actually vest. 
that also gives them a big incentive to stay. It is what's called the golden handcuff structure of the aqua hire. And I think that it's also kind of clever that it coincides pretty nicely with them being able to stay through one or two product life cycles before they go. Now, one drawback to the aqua hire is that, as we covered before with the lift out, it's really not going to scale particularly well, right? So we see that we have this deal structure, it's compensated people pretty nicely, we have this great employment relationship, but that's something that's really easy to do when you have six or less people and really hard to do when you have 50. So we think of it as sort of a specialty mechanism in HR, something where when we're looking at most startups anyway that are really small is going to work for them, but not really something that we're going to generalize when we look at larger mergers and acquisitions. Now with larger teams, intact team retention is also going to be a lot less important because we're gonna see much more overlap between team functions and not everybody is going to be a founder or an engineer. However, when we do use the aqua hire and we get that small team retention, there are also a lot of other benefits that we believe will follow based on our research. It's going to allow you to maintain a specific set of team dynamics that's called the transactive memory system, which we'll get to in a second. It's going to allow you to really prevent knowledge leaks because you won't have anybody from the previous team that's going off somewhere else if you've hopefully captured all of them. You don't have to worry so much that whatever was the special sauce that you just brought over to your firm is going to be spread elsewhere, right? If there was a certain method of out-of-the-box thinking that they had. Finally, these guys are in modular units in a way. So you can think of Facebook or Google as almost like a Lego company where all of their teams are like mini companies that can be shifted around and when they bring new teams in, they keep them like that. They don't necessarily worry about fully integrating them because anybody who's ever gone through a merger knows that one of the hardest things to do is to integrate them into the corporate culture. Here, we just assume that they're operating loosely under the umbrella, but we allow them to behave almost as an independent company within a firm that's full of independent companies, and we bypass a lot of the headaches of that. So just very quickly, the purpose of the team dynamics here is that when you have a small number of people, you're actually able to form something that's called a shared memory. It means that you have to know less because you have this construct of who knows what and who can do what, which means that unconsciously, you, maybe the surgeon that's doing the triple bypass, have stopped thinking about certain things because you know you don't have to lay out your instruments because the nurse always knows how you like them. You never told her that that's how you like them, but it's something that's developed over time, right? There are all these little things. How many people here in the room are married? Okay, how many of you have stopped learning certain skills because your spouse is just better at that? Just a few of you, you don't sort of divvy up who's better at finding bargains, who's better at taking out the trash, who's better at finding things. One thing that I find personally is that my partner is much better at finding things than I am when they are lost. So I no longer worry about how to get better at that. I just let him be the expert in finding things. The original research on transactive memory systems was actually all on couples, but they found that it generalized almost perfectly to the workplace as well. You must undoubtedly at a large corporation have a few work spouses to whom you've also offloaded duties that used to mentally be part of your burden. Now because this is very, very hard to measure, it's a lot easier to just assume that a team has a sort of shared memory construct and to bring them on as a whole. This also means that because they've been working together in that way, they're going to be better at essential versus accidental complexity because together they're able to think more in the abstract, if that makes sense. Because they know a little more about how each person in the team thinks, when somebody does think out of the box, and he has the burden of trying to communicate that to the rest of the team, it's gonna be a lot easier. 
And that's one of the reasons why essential problems are best solved by small groups. Fred Brooks actually, actually is this book. It's called The Mythical Man Month, and it's about software engineering. And his theory is that for every person that you add to a software engineering team when there is already a problem, you add a month to when the project will be completed because that is now another person that has to be integrated into communications. The idea is that when you're adding another person, there's more labor, right? And there's more hours, which means that the project should be done faster. But in actuality, because of the transactive memory system, it's the opposite of that. <coughs> I definitely recommend his book, The Mythical Man Month, because it's full of anecdotes like that that make you think about how teams, and particularly software teams, function completely differently than what we thought. But he also points out that there's a lot of causal ambiguity in trying to figure out how these people work together. Now what causal ambiguity means is that I might know that this team works together really well, but I don't need to know how they do, right? The mechanism doesn't have to be explicit to me. I just need to know that if I acquire them all together, the structure will remain in place. And I also know that none of my competitors have to understand it either. They too know that they don't understand it, but as long as we keep moving the unit around intact, it's going to function as we hope it would. Now going back to those three ideas of why you're going to have benefits from M&A, you're going to have an intact team that also protects the value of your knowledge assets, right? So I talked about the fact that you don't want people to be talking about their intellectual property at the previous firm. Another benefit is that when we have such a rare group of people that are capable of essential complexity, if you can get more of the people off the market, even though they're not as useful to you, you have now hurt your competitors. So this, I think, is definitely another driver of aqua hiring, that people are thinking there is a limited stock of people that are capable of this kind of innovation, and if I can get more of these small teams off the market, that means that I am much more likely to stay ahead of the game, and I am more likely to raise the cost of my rivals in then trying to find these same people. Because everybody is looking at the same market signals, right? Everybody is reading about the same cool new startup that came up with this technology. So now that you've acquired these guys, maybe somebody has to go to several different small firms before they're able to find someone that they can acquire. And then finally, what we already talked about with the team autonomy and an innovation culture. So I'm going to go back to this whole overview of the acquire decision tree because it's a lot of information. It's a really complex phenomenon. So in a nutshell, we know that the firm has started with this big decision, right? They're trying to figure out how are we going to bring outside talent into our firm? Are we going to do it externally or internally? And we know that because they're all focused on high-level innovation, they go to the next step and they go, because the exchange hazards were too high, we're going to have to do this internally. So that brings us to that next question that we covered. Are we going to go with direct hiring or are we going to go with M&A? So the firm then asks the next question. Do we care about hiring a team or not? Typically with a startup, we already said that yes, we do. So then that brings us to the next question. Is our acquisition target a small-sized firm? Yes. Okay, now we've just gone through all the steps that lead to M&A. Now if I had started with this decision tree and just said these are the questions that a firm is going to ask itself in order to get to an aqua hire, it would probably seem pretty abstract and obtuse. But hopefully by leading you through the different mechanisms, trying to paint a fuller picture, we can more better understand why this decision tree functions the way that it does and why the firms ask themselves these questions in that particular order. And hopefully we can also see that when they get to that yes and when they choose to pursue aqua hiring, we're going to have an M&A employment relationship that should be more positive than it would be if we did it with a lift out. And then that's going to lead us to all of these benefits 
that allow us to stay ahead of the competition. Now, before we move on to the wrap up, does anybody have any questions about how all of this works in practice? Yes. So I don't think that they worry so much about profitability. I think what Google tries to do is they have a certain technologi technological barrier that they've hit. They know that in order to solve that, they need somebody with a broad technical expertise, maybe in AI or machine learning. And so they bring in the people from the acquihire and try to apply them to that barrier, if that makes sense. Like they know, OK, we have some sort of AI problem where Siri isn't able to hold a real back and forth conversation. Let's try to bring in some people that we know are probably capable of essential complexity. And if we find in a few years they're able to break through, that's a success if we can keep them long enough to make at least one breakthrough in that area. If at that point Google loses them and they go on to another firm, they will still consider that a win. One thing that I've noticed is that most of the companies that are trying to acquire startups are only trying to keep the value of one product cycle. If they're there longer, then that's just a bonus. But with the difficulty of essential complexity, if you bring on people and you find that within the next 18 months they make one breakthrough that allows your product to move ahead, then that is going to translate to profitability in some way, even if you can't exactly measure it at the time. Now, the deal documents are focused mainly on how to retain them for that three years without them getting too angry. And so it's a difficult balance to strike. On the one hand, you can't allow the options to vest too quickly. On the other hand, if they vest too slowly, sometimes they become resentful and they leave anyway. So I think that's where a lot of the acquihire lawyer efforts go in and trying to figure out how can we make that positive relationship and how can we structure this in such a way that we've given you enough cash so it looks really prestigious and you're happy but not so much cash that this has reduced our ability to get other acquihires. How can we make sure that your investors are just happy enough that they won't come after us? Right? So they're just, they've got barriers where they just have to get over the threshold and then that's good enough for them. There are no investors in Silicon Valley that when their firms get acquired are saying hooray. Right? At best they're saying, okay, well that wasn't a total loss. And that actually brings us to some of these acquihire controversies. Some investors have started to say, all right, well it wasn't a loss because Acquihires are just cover-ups for companies in my portfolio that were never going to be successful anyway. So I guess I won't be angry about that. There's a lot of evidence to the contrary, but more and more in the news we see VCs saying that acquihires are just startups that were never ever going to proceed to the next round. Now, one of the reasons why I don't think that's the case is because I think there are actually two kinds of acquihires. I call one the graceful fall and the other the star catch. And I think that they align kind of perfectly with what happens in general VC trends. So when we see that there's a ton of VC seed funding available, as was true for the last few years, basically up until 12 months ago, then we see a glut that happens in the seed round. So to the left here, you can see what's called the VC funnel, right? Now this is true regardless of how much overall funding there is, that there will be a big leap in the funnel from seed round to series B. It is always much, much harder to get to the series B round of funding than it is to get to the series C round of funding. And this is because the threshold for getting that initial round from the investors is just that they think you're doing something vaguely interesting. So in the last few years, we saw a situation where there was so much seed funding floating around 
that there were probably a lot of startups that got to that round that maybe shouldn't have been startups in the first place. Now they don't tend to go much farther than that, but because all of those startups are then exiting and they're looking for an acquisition, it creates the sense that that's what all aqua hires look like. But then you actually have to look at this statistic, which is that most uh, startups that are aqua hired don't actually raise any external funding. So if it was actually true that aqua hires are just cover-ups for failing startups, then that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Because if you don't have external investors that you have to make happy and you didn't raise any external funding in the first place, then why exactly does someone need to come in and save you? They're not going to do that because they're nice, right? I don't think that Google and Facebook and Yahoo are known for rescuing startups because they're so kind. They have to feel that they're getting something out of it. So that's one reason why I think it's mainly just a VC trend in order to explain um, why their portfolio performance is being affected by, by startups. Sorry, by aqua hires. Also, if we look at this uh, nice little advertisement here, you can see that there's quite a market that's formed around some of these dying startups. If your startup gets seed funding and it does not get Series uh, A funding within 13 months, then CV Insights will add you to their list of dying startups and they will sell that list to a potential acquirer for $6,895. You will not be acquired for very much money and you're not necessarily what I would classify as an aqua hire, but it certainly does cloud the field a bit. Now, one controversy that I think isn't actually talked about enough right, is that there may actually be a decline in IPOs that is due to aqua hires. If I were a VC, I wouldn't be very happy about aqua hires because there is a chance that the essential complexity that would have led to a unicorn, which would have saved your whole portfolio, has now been snatched away six months into that founder's product life cycle. So, the, uh, you could think of it this way. The startups that are maybe most likely to fail drop out of your portfolio because they're part of that graceful fall, but the startups that are the most likely to win, to be your hole-in-one, they also drop out of your portfolio and they never go to IPO. Recently, there's been a real decline in startup IPOs where we can see that in 2017, there were only seven in the first quarter. And I actually think that might be because we had five years of very aggressive aqua hiring, and now we're beginning to see the results. But I want to make it clear that what I presented before was my actual research, and I am now presenting to you my speculation. My educated speculation, but speculation nevertheless. The other thing that we have to consider is that we are now in a big decline of seed funding. We're in an odd situation where the VCs actually have more cash in their portfolios than they've had since 2010, but they're not spending it. There's been a decline in deals, not just in Silicon Valley, but across the United States. And so that means that there will be a lot more startup failures in that gap between the uh, seed round and Series A. Now, I suspect that they won't be sitting on that cash forever, and this might reverse but it means that there is a vacuum that corporations have been stepping into, which is actually kind of interesting and I think something worth people pursuing and looking into, that maybe CVC will be the next trend in aqua hiring. Now, there is a lot more to cover on this topic and I could probably cover it forever because new things happen every day. But for now, I'm going to thank you for coming for letting me introduce you to this fascinating phenomenon. And if you have questions or want to continue the conversation, I invite you to email me at jselvi at stanford.edu. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hide. I work for a venture capital firm. Um, 
I have a question about, um, have you ever um, done any research on uh, the outcome of the aqua hires? How, how long they lasted in a company or how they, they quit after the vesting period or et cetera? So while I haven't done research on that, um, my colleagues over at Duke have, Chatterjee and Patro, they had a paper in 2013. And what they found is that a year after aqua hires, Typically, 88% of the team still stayed on, and more than 90% of the founders stayed on. So what I think that equates to is that sometimes someone would lose one engineer. They didn't look at several years out. I think because of the product life cycles, they mainly looked at one year out and 18 months out to see if they stayed for that critical period, and typically they did. Well, I know that it's a lot of information to take in, especially if prior to today, AquaHire had only been something that you'd seen in a news headline or a blog. And so if you think of any other questions, particularly if you're at a VC or at a firm that does CVC, um, I'm definitely open to continuing the discussion because there isn't at this time very much research on AquaHires. It's essentially myself, Chatterjean uh, Patro, and also two lawyers, Coyle and Polsky. And that might be the, the sum total of people that are doing active research on the topic.